former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that he had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1, 1 through 8. You can breathe now. <laughs> it's good to be here. It's great to see everyone. Appreciate the congregation here. Appreciate the school. Been called everything this afternoon from a terrorist <laughs> to an instructor uh, and, and all things in between. And I'm, I'm sure the students love me as much as I love them. <laughs> we had a good day yesterday. I think we all learned a little bit. We, we love them. That's all I know to say. We, we love them. <laughs> love them dearly. I don't know what happens, but for some reason... I keep getting put at the one o'clock hour on Saturday. Brother Sapp called a few months ago, said, Brother Bach, did you speak on Terry for the Holy Ghost? It'll be Thursday, you know, last session. Good, good to go. That's good. Good. <laughs> Until the schedule comes out and it says, same everything but Saturday at one. So I did, I, I started thinking. I said, what have I done to Brother Sapp? I said, well, I, I, haven't, I haven't done anything to him. I'm, I've been good to Brother Sapp. <laughs> I said, it's, it's Brother Help. <laughs> and I went to his house a few months ago, and I behaved myself. Everything was fine, no problem. I said, no, nah, it's not Brother Help. And it, and it hit me. It hit me right between the eyes. One of the elders here is a student in school. <laughs> and I said, there it is. <laughs> it's Brother Pew. <laughs> He's going to get me one way or another. <laughs> Let's talk about tearing for the Holy Ghost. One of the greatest disputes among modern churchgoers involves the Holy Spirit. Most denominations, if not all, believe in some form or another of what is generally known as a direct operation of the Spirit, meaning that the Holy Spirit does something to them or for them that they cannot control, much less explain. Now, some claim these experiences have happened to them in the most random of places. For example, the grocery store line. Or it could be the ball field. It could be the church building. It could be the hospital. And in one instance, one man claimed to have had a direct operation of the Holy Spirit while he was standing in the shower with his nose bleeding from all the cocaine he had sniffed the night. So there's no limit to what people say. Now our assignment is to come to a scriptural understanding of the phrase tarrying for the Holy Ghost. And according to most denominations, tarrying for the Holy Ghost involves receiving the gift of salvation from the Holy Spirit by means of prayer or supplication. Others say it's only by faith. Now, most of the individuals who tarry for the Holy Ghost believe that the evidence of such is made known to the world by speaking in tongues. Now, their version of tongues is nothing even remotely close to what the inspired book of Acts teaches tongues to have been which were known languages, according to Acts 2, 4 through 6. Three things we want to do this afternoon in a timely manner. Let's just get started. First, let's talk about the precepts. Three precepts we need to understand. Precept number one is context. Every word, phrase, sentence, and passage of the Bible is governed, explained, qualified, and correctly understood by the context in which it is located. It is dishonest. It is dishonest to lift a word from one context and assign it a meaning based upon another unrelated context. So, any conclusion reached on a specific verse or section of verses must be in harmony, number one, with the immediate context, 
That is the verses before and after. The remote context, that would be the book in which it is located. And since there are no contradictions in the Bible, it must be in harmony with the totality of what the Bible teaches. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1. And let's see if we can see one that is fairly simple to understand. So let's consider the context here of Galatians 1 and verse number 6 and see what we can determine. Galatians 1, 6 says, I marvel that ye, pause, <clears throat> ye is a plural pronoun. Now to whom does this plural pronoun apply? Because a pronoun always has an antecedent, whether it is expressed or implied. Well, back up to verse number 2. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches, the congregations of Galatia. I marvel that ye, ye who? The congregations, the churches of Galatia. Now that's not hard to understand, is it? That's not difficult to see. That's based on that immediate context. Now, since this plural pronoun in Galatians 1.6 applies to the churches of Galatia, would it be acceptable to believe that every ye in the Bible always applies only to members of the church in Galatia? No. no. It would not be acceptable because why? Pronouns always have antecedents, whether expressed or implied, and it is governed, ruled, and understood properly by the context in which it is located. Now, if we will apply, apply this principle, in other words, this precept, to every passage we read, much misunderstanding of the Bible will be dissolved. It will go away. It will cease to be. Precept number one. We're going to apply this to Acts 1 through 8. Acts 1, 1 through 8 here in a minute. Is context. Precept number two is implication and inference. Here's something every student of the Bible needs to know. Number one, God implies. Number two, man infers. The implication, since it is given by inspiration of God, is inspired and it is infallible. However, the inference is not inspired and therefore subject to error. It could be incorrect. Now, honest students of the Bible seek to discover who or what God implied in the text. Unfortunately, many are not honest students of the Bible. And use a text that sounds good to them regardless of the context as a sugar stick to validate their preconceived beliefs. For instance, who is implied in the word whosoever of Matthew 19, 9? And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication, and shall marry another committeth what? Adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth what? Commit adultery. Question. Who did God imply in the whosoever or the whoso of Matthew 19, 9? Well, some may say and may correctly infer that only members of the church are under consideration in the legislation of Matthew 19, 9. Others may say that Matthew 19.9 belongs as a part and parcel of the Old Testament canon. But the truth is what? Who's implied in the whosoever or the whoso of Matthew 19.9? All humanity. That's right. Any person. Why is that? Preacher? Well, the answer is that Matthew 19.9 is a part of the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. The gospel of Christ is the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament is applied to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto only members of the church. Is that what yours reads? What does it say? What does it say? Who's implied in that? Every creature. All humanity. So precept number two is implication. God implies an inference. Man infers. The implication is inspired and infallible. However, we may look at it and incorrectly infer something from any passage. Now, precept number three, miracles. Four questions that we're going to ask and answer with regard to miracles. Number one, what is a miracle? Miracles were, observe that, miracles were 
an extraordinary occurrence which could not be explained by the laws of nature and provided evidence of the intervention of deity. Deity is God. Miracles involve the supernatural. That is above the natural order. Like what? Walking on water. That's not normal. That's not the natural order of things. A man being four day dead, his sister say, Lord, he's thinking. <laughs> Jesus going up and say, Lazarus, come forth, and here he comes, grave clothes and all. That's not the natural order of things. Amen. That is supernatural, and therefore that is a miracle. Now, miracles were not a violation of God's providential law, but were simply what? Above the natural order of things. Question number two regarding miracles. What were some purposes of miracles? I'll give you four that you can remember pretty easily. Number one, creation. From the material aspect, there was nothing God spoke. Six literal 24 hour days later, here we are. Creation. Hebrews 3, 4, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. All right? Creation, incarnation. What does that have to do with it? The Word, the eternal Word, John 1, 1 through 3. The eternal Word being made flesh, John 1, 14, being born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, being confirmed in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. How do you explain all that? One word, miracle. That's not the natural order of things. Creation, incarnation, the last two we need to pay close attention to, revelation. How would we know anything about what God said about anything if he didn't tell someone somewhere along the line? For God to speak directly to a person, that's not the natural order of things. That is supernatural. That was a miracle. And then number four, confirmation. Why would you listen to an apostle of Christ in the first century? It might have to strike you with blindness. <laughs> right? It might have to raise the dead. He's liable to do something like that. So miracles help reveal and confirm both God's message and messenger. Question number three regarding miracles. Did miracles really happen? Have you ever seen a miracle? I'm looking, I'm looking at my bottle now. I'll see who says that. <laughs> Did miracles really happen? We answer that in the affirmative. Yes, absolutely. How can you say so? The Bible is the most trustworthy document on the planet and the Bible clearly teaches that genuine miracles actually occurred and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that believing he might have life through his name. Where's that from, students? A great hush. <laughs> See why they call me a terrorist? Acts 20, or rather John 20. 30 and 31. Now, question number four. Do miracles occur today? No. Miracles were temporary and were never intended by God to be permanent and perpetual. From the viewpoint of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, they were still yet future. But from our perspective, looking backward, it's history. Charity never failed. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What is that which is perfect? Some will say Jesus. Well, we understand what you mean by that. But in the context, it would indicate the completed New Testament. The completed final will of God revealed to mankind. So... Do miracles occur today? No ma'am and no sir, they do not. Now that's point number one. That's three <laughs> precepts that we need to have in our minds. Now let's go on to the second point of the sermon. And that is the passages. Look with me in your Bibles in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and let's begin in verse number 1. Now let's take these precepts that we have just discussed and let's apply them to this passage of Acts 1, 1 through 8 and let's see what we can determine. Acts 1-1, the former treatise. For the sake of time, we're going to go quick. That's the book of Luke. Based off what? The pronoun that follows it. The former treatise have I. Who's that I? That is a pronoun. And a pronoun always has an antecedent, whether it's expressed or implied. That would be the beloved physician Luke. That is a reasonable conclusion. The book of Luke... Written by Luke, the beloved physician, the former treatise, Have I made, O Theophilus? That was a real man. That was his name. We do not believe that's a pseudonym for Christians at large. This was that man's name. 
have of all that Jesus, that's Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Lamb of God, began both to do and teach. There's a good principle for every person in here. Number one, we live right. Number two, we teach right. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up. That's talking about in verses 9 through 11 of this same chapter. After that he, through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, inspired and empowered Jesus and the apostles to do supernatural things. After that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments. Now watch. This is going, we need to understand this. We tarry for the Holy Ghost. You waiting for something? Huh? Look. Unto the apostles whom he, who's the he? Jesus. Jesus had chosen. Now there were at least three different kinds or types of apostles in the New Testament that were true apostles. Number one, apostles of God. Hebrews 3, 1, that'd be Jesus, wouldn't it? Number two, there were apostles of the church. The apostle was one sent forth with a message or commission. How was Barnabas an apostle? He was an apostle. He was sent forth or commissioned by the church. Acts 14, 14. But by and large, when we hear the word apostle, what comes to your mind? The apostles of Christ. The apostles whom he, Jesus, had chosen. Now this is paramount in understanding the following context. The plural pronouns will therefore apply to the apostles of Christ. Let's put it in practice. Verse number three, to whom? pronoun. It applies to whom? The apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he, Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many what? Infallible proofs. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, but Jesus rose again from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now observe, it's by many infallible proofs. What is the single most historically proven event in the history of the world? The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the grave. And it's recorded in the most reliable document ever known to man. That's right. The New Testament. Amen. So we can know that these things are accurate, that they are correct. Now, look at the rest of the verse. Being seen of them. Who them? That's a pronoun. Them who them? The apostles whom he had chosen. Forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, which is the church of Christ, Matthew 16, 18, and 19, and being assembled together with, King James has it in italics, them, don't worry, it's going to come back around, commanded them, who them? The churches of Galatia. Right? Where's that in the context? What is this in its context? Who is implied in that pronoun? Based on this context, the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, commanded them that they, you get the idea, should not depart from Jerusalem. That's a specific place, isn't it? But wait for the promise of the Father. Now watch. Which said he, ye, that's a plural pronoun, who's ye in the context? Now all this tarrying for the Holy Ghost, where does that come from? Where does that come from? Misunderstanding the scripture. For ye have heard of me for John, that's John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, John the Immerser, truly baptized with or in water. But in contrast to John's baptism, which had a beginning and it had an end, by the way. But ye, ye who? How do I read that and say, that's Brock. That's Brock, right? Where's Brock in this context? Am I one of the apostles whom he had chosen? If I ever say that, you'll know I've gone crazy. <laughs> you'll know there's no way. That can't apply to Brock. But ye shall be baptized, immersed, overwhelmed with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So far, what do we know about this? This is a promise, right? This immersion in Holy Spirit is a promise. It is a promise given to whom based upon this context. The apostles whom he had chosen. When they... Now, you think I'm going to get tired of this, but I'm not because we have to understand this. That is a pronoun, is it not? It is a plural pronoun. Who fits in this context? The apostles 
whom he had chosen. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, despite all the Old Testament scriptures and Jesus' plain teaching, these 11 men still had a misunderstanding of the inherent nature of the Lord's kingdom. Do we understand the inherent nature of the Lord's kingdom? As I would suspect, many, if not most of us, are citizens of that kingdom right now as we speak. Put your finger right there. Turn back a few pages and let's go back to that former treatise. What would that former treatise be? Luke. Now, I told you a while ago. Let's see if you're paying attention. Luke. There you go. Good job. Luke, the student came through. <laughs> Luke. Let's back up to the book of Luke and let's look at Luke 24 beginning in verse number 45. Now the inspired writer, Luke, the beloved physician, is referencing that former treatise. Let's see how this former treatise ends. Luke 24, 45, Then opened he, that's Jesus, their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, now watch, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at where? Jerusalem. And ye... If you'll back up to Mark 16, 14, you'll see that he is the 11. Judas Iscariot has already done what he's done. And ye are witnesses of these things. Look carefully. And behold, I send the promise of my Father. We looked in Acts 1. What is that promise? It's Holy Spirit baptism. I send the promise of my Father upon you even individually. You who? That's Brock. Right? Is that Brock? No. It's not Brock. That's not you either, friend. Sorry. <laughs> now I get to be the harbinger of bad news. It's not you. I'm a terrorist. I'm shooting them down. My name. <laughs> not you either. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye, all you, eleven, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued. Now look, I don't know if your Bible's like mine, but I like to draw in mine. Draw a circle around promise and then draw a circle around power and connect the two. You see that? Until ye be endued with power from on high. Now what do we know? This is a promise of the Father. Jesus is going to be the one who fulfills this promise. This promise is Holy Spirit baptism. And this promise of Holy Spirit baptism was a degree or a measure of miraculous power. Supernatural power. How do you know that, Brother Preacher? Back to Acts 1. Let's see what this promise of power would enable these men to do. Now, look at verse number 7, Acts 1. And he, Jesus, said unto them, run these pronouns down. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now recall, the apostles were to wait patiently in Jerusalem for the promise to be fulfilled. Did they understand where they needed to wait? Yes, they did. Did they wait? Yes, they did. Was that a condition attached to that promise? Yes, it was. Did they meet the condition? Yes, they did. Then what happened? They received the promise. Now look at verse number 8. But ye, who's that ye? The apostles whom he had chosen. But ye shall receive what? Power. What sort of power? Supernatural power. Miraculous power. Given by whom? Given by the Holy Spirit. Who sent the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, I'm going to send him. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, even individually. The apostles as individuals experienced Holy Spirit baptism. And ye, you plural, you all, all y'all, if you're in the south, right? Who all's in the context? The apostles whom he had chosen. Ye shall be witnesses. Now this promise of power was baptism in the Holy Spirit, which was indeed a measure or a degree of supernatural power. Now what was this going to enable them to do, to be witnesses? Now the apostles of Christ were empowered by the Holy Spirit to recall everything Christ had spoken to them as well as what they had seen and heard. Anybody have their favorite 
favorite verse from John chapters 14, 15, 16, 17. How be when he, the spirit of truth, a spirit of truth has come, he shall guide you into now apply that, apply that principle. Who spoke that? Jesus spoke that. To whom did he speak that in the context of John really 13 through 17? The apostles whom he had chosen. One of my favorites is Mark 13, 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, watch, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate it. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye for. It is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. How many preachers have misapplied that to themselves? Go goof off all week long and think I'm going to get up. When I get up behind this pulpit, Brother Sapp, the Holy Ghost is going to give it to me. <laughs> Wrong. Amen. That's a promise to the apostles. Right. That's an apostolic promise of inspiration. They got it how? By inspiration. How do we get it, fellas? Study. Perspiration. They got to sweat it out. <laughs> Study your work. It's an acceptable answer. Look at Acts 1. <coughs> But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto, me, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and how far? Unto the utmost part of the earth. Five things to note about this passage. Number one, the promise. Commands are to be obeyed. Promises are to be received and enjoyed. Now, some of God's promises have conditions. First meet the conditions, then what? Receive the promise. Now what is this promise in this context? You go back and look and read. Word number two is the power. Now the context of Acts 1, 1 through 8 clearly references miraculous or supernatural power and the age of miracles has passed. Number three, the people. Who are the people in this context? Of Acts 1, 1 through 8. Well, we can surely see Jesus, right? We can understand that. But those plural pronouns would apply to whom? The churches of Galatia? No. The apostles whom he had chosen. So the apostles of Christ were the ones to whom this promise of power was made. Word number four would be the place. Didn't he tell them to tarry ye in the city of Sumter? <laughs> Are you aware? <laughs> Did you read that in the Bible? <laughs> Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Now, how many people do you think read this and say, I, I, I got to go to Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. It's time to get up. Wife and children, let's, let's go to Jerusalem. And wait for this promise of power. It said probably nobody ever. But they think they'll disregard the place and still receive the power wherever they are. How does that work? And word number five would be the purposes. After receiving the promise of power, the apostles of Christ were enabled and empowered to be infallible witnesses when they were inspired to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, among other things, watch. They had no language barriers with any person. Ever. You see all these guys that claim to be apostles on TV? They get up and they get all excited and all hyper and they speak English pretty well, some of them. Then they go drop them in the middle of some foreign country and all of a sudden they need an interpreter. Well, how does that happen? Huh? Tongues were known languages. Why doesn't the Holy Spirit just inspire you to speak whatever this language is you need to speak without flaw or error? See, it doesn't work that way. That's the simple answer. Now, people could observe the miracles the apostles demonstrated, which in turn helped to prepare their hearts for the truth of the gospel. Now, who can now demonstrate what the apostles did? We haven't even got into the laying on of hands, have we? We had not even touched that because it wasn't necessarily in the context, so to speak, of Acts 1, 1 to 8. But there was something in the first century that could help establish that these men were the apostles of Jesus Christ. What was it? That put your hands on you and you like to walk back or however you get back home with a supernatural ability from the Holy Spirit. Where's a man that can do that? They're dead. They're gone on into eternity. Now in the third place, let's talk about the practicality for today very quickly. 
So what? In other words, all this talk about Holy Ghost, all this talk about apostles whom he had chosen, so what? I want to suggest three words. Word number one is care. Care, C-A-R-E. It is possible, though not permissible, to handle the word of God deceitfully. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Is that, is that us? Now, it's possible. It's not permissible. But it is possible to handle the word of God deceitfully. Do we want to be known as that type of people? Is that who we are? Absolutely not. So great care should be exerted to make certain we are not lifting any passage out of the context in which it is written. That's right. Number one, we see what did it mean when it was originally written. Then later on, we'll say, now how, how can we apply this? But what did it mean when the inspired writer put it to paper, Amen. so to speak? That's number one. Great care has to be exerted, number one. What did it mean then? Once we understand that, let's move forward and see how does that apply to us because we know the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and is a discerner of what? The thoughts and intents of the heart. You know where that is. Word number two is caution. Did you pay close attention <coughs> Even though we just looked at it briefly to Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Friends, mishandling God's word has serious consequences. Do we want to be of that lot? To mishandle God's word? Have you read toward the end of the Bible? Revelation 22, 18 and 19? Go, go look and see. Serious consequences come to those who mishandle and abuse God's word. So we need to exert great caution. <laughs> word number three is correction. Did you come in here this afternoon thinking you were tearing from the Holy Ghost? Let the word of God correct that. Now, rather than misusing the Bible to fit what we already believe, we ought to allow the Bible to form our mind. Those who are wrong about tarrying for the Holy Ghost, write this down, are also wrong about salvation. Right. Salvation is by faith, friend, 2 Timothy 3.15, but it is not by faith alone. James 2.17 and 24. In order to get into Christ, we must be baptized into Him. Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we should be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, your old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin should die, should be put to death. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Romans 6, 1-7. The age of miracles is past. The apostles of Christ accomplished their assignments. Conclusion. No one alive today is to tarry in Jerusalem or anywhere else waiting to receive any form of miraculous power. In conviction, conversion, and sanctification, the Holy Spirit works through the medium of of God's power unto salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 17, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Have you obeyed the Spirit's message as it has been revealed on the pages of the New Testament? Thank you for your time. Amen.